Hey humans, how's it going? Susan Ruth here. Thanks for listening to another episode of Hey Human Podcast. This is episode 183, and I recorded it here in Los Angeles. I sat down with Emmy award-winning writer Russ Woody. Russ is a producer writer for shows like Mad About You, Murphy Brown, the original, Good Sports, Style and Substance, Room for Two, Everybody Loves Raymond, The Middle, Double Rush, The Jeff Foxworthy Show, Becker, Good Advice, Instant Mom, Parenthood, Notes from the Underbelly, Haters Back Off, and Sybil, and a writer on St. Elsewhere, Hill Street Blues, New Heart, Fantasy Island, The New Murphy Brown, Webster, Valerie, uh, Smoldering Lust, Annie McGuire, uh, just thing after thing after thing. He's also written books, The Wheel of Noldoid, uh, Effed Up, which I read and is great. And the book that we are in the conversation for this episode about, Tuesdays with Ted. And I read that book, of course, and it is exceptional. It's beautiful, uh, a lovely tribute to Russ's father who passed away from ALS. I just want to get this out there. The ALS Association sponsors research and provides victims with vital service and supplies. If you'd like to make a donation or if someone you know is suffering from this disease, contact the ALS Association at alsa.org. And uh, hospice, information about that, you can make a donation and get information at hospicenet.org. I'll put those links on heyhumanpodcast.com. On the afternoon that Russ and I had this conversation, uh, there were so many planes going on overhead. So I had to edit a lot of the plane noise out. I did not edit out content other than the sound of Russ and I getting mad at the planes for driving overhead. So, or flying overhead. I mean, I guess they're driving. They're driving in the air. That's still... Is that driving? Driving and flying? Whatever. Anyway, you get the idea. So you're not missing anything uh, except for some bad jokes, probably. But uh, I did the best I could to weed out all that uh, air traffic noise. There was a moment where Russ gets up to go into the other room. And uh, when he gets back, at, at that point, I reference a quote from his book that I had brought up in the beginning of the conversation. So that will make more sense. And Russ talks about his sculptures. Um, yes, he's also a sculptor. He makes these great little creatures. They're all over his house. And I thought that they all look like famous famous people. Um, there was one that I thought looked like Jack Palance. There's a W.C. Fields looking one. There are all these different uh, gnome-like creatures around his house that he made. So that was really cool. Anyway, the, the gist of it is we talked about his book, Tuesdays with Ted. I cannot tell you enough to read this book. It is so well done beautifully written I cried I laughed Um, it was just it's a beautiful tribute to his father and it's called Tuesdays with Ted because uh, during his father's illness Russ was writing for Becker which was Ted Danson's show and Ted was really uh, a big help you know a very loving supportive friend in the last uh, year year and a half of of Woody's life of Russ's dad's life. So anyway, it's just, it's a gorgeous book and I'll put links to it up there on Hey Human Podcast and please read it. It's just, it's exceptional. Um, yeah, the usual stuff. Hey Human Podcast can, uh, is on Instagram and Facebook and Susan Ruthism for my Twitter, Facebook and Instagram for my personal and Susan Ruth, if you want to check out my music and art at susanruth.com. You can email me, susan at heyhumanpodcast.com. There's an Amazon portal at heyhumanpodcast.com's website right there on the front page. If you shop Amazon, do so through that portal. It helps support Hey Human. And uh, rate and review Hey Human on iTunes. I mentioned the links page that's on the heyhumanpodcast.com website. Definitely go check that out. I have so many links on there, uh, references, from the conversations that I have with my guests. And you can check all that stuff out there, including Russ's books, of course. Thanks for listening. And 
thank you for understanding about the planes. I did the best I could. Um, you're not missing anything, I promise. Everything's in there. I, I do ask Russ at the end if he'd want to come back for an, <laughs> another interview just in case there was nothing salvageable from our conversation because of the planes. But it all turned out okay. So good for that. And I guess that's about it. Here we go. Russ Woody, thank you for being on Hey Human. Uh, it's a pleasure. I'm so glad. I guess because I'm a Hey Human. You are indeed. Right. As far as I can tell. Well, I'm not like Abraham Lincoln, though. Well, I think he was humanish. <laughs> kind of. Yeah, I yeah. think he was uh, better than a lot of us. You know, he, with his hat on, he was seven feet tall. I think that's probably why he wore it. Yeah. Yeah. He and leaned in, as they say. Yeah. into his height because I think during his uh, during his in the beginning when they were starting to take pictures of him people said oh but you're so tall it's going to unnerve people so he thought hmm, well I might as well huh. go with it yeah yeah. from what I've read she used to make a lot of jokes about how he looked yeah self-deprecating yeah yeah said if I was if I was two-faced do you think I'd use this one <laughs> good joke <laughs> cheers <laughs> Cheers. Thank you for having Delightful. me to your lovely home. Ah, it's all right. Mm. It's there's a bunch of, there's a lot of toilets and they always need fixing, so it's not that. <laughs> Got to be a metaphor in there somewhere. It's not that glamorous, yeah. We are here because we were introduced by a mutual friend, Joe. Joe, I just met, and he is a friend of my friend Randy. My friend Randy knows Joe. When I moved here, he said you should talk to Joe. He's great, and then Joe said we should meet yeah. at this coffee shop um, and, and he, so you moved to the Studio City area I did at first I lived um, in another part of town downtown and that didn't work out Ugh. I had to get out of there rapidly yeah and as luck and fate and providence would have it whichever you choose to ascribe to yeah uh, I ended up just up the street from you, actually. I'm ah. your neighbor. Ah, that's good. That's good to know. Yeah. I, then I'll need your address because I, I often have to borrow stuff. Okay. I got toilet paper. I got tea. I got spices. Hold on. I got to write this down. <laughs> I write this stick stuff of butter? A gallon of milk? <laughs> I, I have a list of what all my neighbors have. Oh, that's so good. That, yeah, I think when that's I run smart. out. When the apocalypse comes. I never have to go to the grocery store. It's you the best. No, what's up? You could probably zip line from house to house around here and that's do not a, a bad one of those idea. Basket systems, maybe? Yeah, yeah. I'll, uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that idea, but well, it's. You could set someone on it, maybe. A very interesting idea. I'm just an idea girl. I know. Implementation. I'm is really getting that feeling. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, so, and we I, met. Yes, through yeah. Joe. Yeah. And through Joe. Kind of in the street, which was fine. I mean, kind of in the sh coffee shop, but mostly in the street. Yeah. yeah. Sidewalkish, yeah. Yeah, and you said, I wrote this book. And I said, I like books. And it kind of went from there. And then you read it in a day and a, a, half, and a half. And I'm like, I'm, yeah. I, a friend it's of a mine uh, wrote a novel that he's about to go out with. I mean, he hasn't. Uh, it hasn't published it yet yeah. or anything but read a novel and it's brilliant it's but it's like about the same length as my book and uh, it's been um a, two weeks now i've been trying i like read four or five pages at night and i fall asleep, fall asleep. And, yeah I, uh, I had to read sitting up or i'll get sleepy okay for sure all right that's i'll try that but yeah boost up the pillows and all right i might fall off the side of the bed you wrote a great book tuesdays with ted let's plug it now in fact <laughs> <laughs> here i'm holding up a picture of the book now well i have the book with me oh Ta -da! oh all right i thought you got it digitally no i bought it on amazon wow like a goddamn american <laughs> you're incredible <laughs> it's really good I Thank really, you. I cried a few times. <laughs> I tried not to cry. Oh, when I saw the title, Tuesdays with Ted, I thought, oh, that's weird. That's kind of like Tuesdays, Tuesdays with, with Maury. Maury. Yeah. Come to find out that that was intentional. That's, yeah. I, I, that should make sense. Well, let's start to go backwards a little bit. Uh, are you from California? Yes. Northern. Oh, okay. California. Yeah. Beautiful out there. So, yes, it is, actually. Yeah. Yeah. I like it. No. I really missed it a lot when I first moved here. I Where'd you move here from? Here. I love, love, love LA. Um, I, by way of, I'm from Seattle. 
we traveled around a lot when Jesus, I was a kid. Seattle, that's beautiful. Yeah, and then I spent the last 13 years in Nashville songwriting. Oh, yeah. And right. uh, then I moved here. Wow. I, yeah. I mean, I don't even like you that much, but I'm trying to be nice because I really think you're going to be successful. Well, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> you can I ride figured. on my coattails. Yeah. <laughs> so I figure, you know. Um, what brought you here to Southern California? Was it riding? Yeah. 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 Uh, I just, uh, I spent a couple years after college as a bartender up in Chico, California, and uh, and then uh, a friend and I moved down here in order to... Uh, get into the writing world of television specifically or just I mean those days I had vainglorious ideas of becoming the next uh, screenwriter of the next thing like uh, everybody does when they first move here and then um, we uh, my friend and I we got a job with a I bartended here for a while and then we got a job uh, on a show called soap as production assistants do you know that show it's a classic i've watched a lot of it on the internet yeah mm-hmm. yeah because i just all the actors in that show are amazing billy yeah. crystal got billy his crystal start. yeah mm-hmm. a, a woman came up to chico when we were students there and and she was one of the producers of soap and she said you know if you come down to la uh, look me up she said that to the class but i don't think she thought anybody would actually look her up and so we looked her up and she said well look we don't have anything but we're thinking about starting this show called Benson and uh, one other show it's a living or something like that and so uh, a number of months later when they started doing that they we got jobs as production assistants on Benson or on soap? Benson okay Benson Benson yeah. which is the spin-off to soap yes Robert Guillaume very good mm-hmm. that's great he died too didn't he yeah a lot of people die smokers probably Probably. That's like got to be the answer. Did you feel prepared to start right in on a show? I mean, that was what you wanted, but you know, sometimes oh. when you get in there, you're like, what have I done? No, you, you know, it's like anything else. You learn, you fumble your way through what you're doing and you make mistakes. And you, I mean, that first job on Benson, I think I was one of the shitty, can I swear? I think I was one of the fucking shittiest goddamn pissant uh, PAs that they ever had. Oh, you can't say PA. God, you'd like, my hands are tied here. I can't. <laughs> um, uh, so uh, then I, the next season I went to, uh, I was a production assistant on Bosom Buddies. A classic? It's a classic. And I have the outtakes here somewhere, and it may be the only existing copy in the world. Except I can't find it. Oh. But um, <laughs> it was so funny. Hildy, but that's a show I really enjoyed. Hildy and, let's see if I can remember. Buff, Buffy and Hildy? Yeah. Fuck, I can't the, believe. That's the women. Yeah. And the boys were? Um, Crick and Henry. Do you know why I remember that? That's because, great. Because uh, a girl that I knew named her fish Kip and Henry, and Henry, and that's why I just remember that. That's sad. I yeah. Fish. <laughs> that's. Um, They're dead. I should have named my kids that. Kip and Henry. Yeah. Well, I named Wait, one of them what? Henry. Henry. Yeah. Oh, it's that's right. <laughs> <laughs> Stay no, with me, I'll remember. I, I know. <laughs> I'm going to have you on speed dial. Where did I live after Oakland? Hold on, i gotta, I got to call Susan. Um, no, the, uh, I ran into him years later. He didn't remember me, um, but I was with Henry, and we were at Cirque du Soleil or something. And I, so I took Henry up to him, and Henry was little at the time. But I said... Um, and I told him I was a PA and I said this is my son Henry and he shook Henry's hand and he's very nice to Henry and then a few days later I sent him a note and said um, because as I walked away I said do you, do you know Tom Hanks is a movie star do you know what a movie star is he says uh, it's somebody who's, who's on the movies and I said yeah I said but this is like a big person in the movies he says oh like Dumbo so I sent Tom a note explaining that and he and he wrote back very nicely and he said yeah you had to name him Henry huh? not Kip that's funny classic that is good. Um, he was a very nice guy though I mean just remembering from from when I was a PA 
Yeah, you know, it's interesting. <clears throat> I watched on on YouTube a, some old little clip of Bosom Buddies, and it's hard not to watch Tom Hanks. Yeah. He had well, I don't know what it is, but he had that thing yeah. that just. Because there were great actors on that show. Oh, yeah. But there was yeah. something... You gravitate yeah, to Yeah, about him. him. You just could not look at him. Yeah. Yeah, it's funny, isn't it? I, we, as a production assistant, I would I got invited to the poker games on Saturday with the producers. And everybody's my age anyway. So Tom and Peter, I think, are both my age. So... Uh, but I, you know, I'm sitting there playing poker with Tom Hanks and Scolari and and a bunch of the other um, producers and yeah, so cool. Great. Yeah. So cool. So much about, I mean, anything, I suppose, any business, but is the relationships that are developed outside of the thing. Yeah. Because the thing gets in the way so much. Well, except for writers. Mm. Because we're stuck in the same room for 8, 10, 12 hours a day. And there's a lot of... Uh, technic I'm getting technical now. There's a lot of jerking off in there. There's mm. no... It's not straight. But that's how you get to the ideas. Yes. Yeah. You have to go through all the gobbledygook to get to the other side. That's true in songwriting. Yeah. You know, you get together and you just start talking. And then it goes into the wild and woolly. Yeah. And it comes back the other side. And one person, there may be one word that just sets off the yeah. dendrites and makes you crazy. And yeah. You have to get that. Savoy truffle. Mm -hmm. and, Love it. Um, yeah, yeah. Coming through the bathroom window. I would imagine that would be so exciting. Ah, oh, yeah. I know it is for songwriting and I can't imagine that. Well, uh, there's a story mature. in there about yeah. how the story, we came up with a story about my dad. Yeah. Um, which, uh, for your listeners, basically we started joking around about my dad who had to use a, a machine to help him talk. And he was a nice guy, but one of the writers came in and he made a joke that my he saw my dad out by the guard's gate and uh, the guard wouldn't let him in, so he was just tearing the guard an asshole with his machine. And we could all imitate his machine because that's which in the writer's room you can imitate all the actors and all that sort of stuff. So you get, I can't even do it anymore, but you know, and, and it was Matt Weiner, if I'm remembering it correctly the guy who did Mad Men and stuff like that but he goes so your dad's out there and he typed something in his machine and he pushed a button and he said open the fucking gate or I'll rip your head off and shit down your neck and we all started cracking up and making jokes of the most vile things my dad could be saying which is hilarious because your dad is like the sweetest one he's I can a understand. very nice guy <laughs> and that's how the story came around it's a story about basically figure you know a really sweet guy gets a machine from dr becker and then as soon as he can speak for himself he becomes an asshole and so i and i i had to you know after we broke the story bro breaking a story is is getting it all structured and stuff and uh um after we broke it i i would always stop by my dad's house uh, after work and so i said i got to clear this with my dad first because it's about an old guy with white hair and he has ALS and he has a machine and it's kind of obvious <laughs> who he is. So I told my dad, I said, you know, it's about an old guy and he's nice and then he gets a machine and he's an asshole. And my dad just cracked up and gave me a thumbs up. I found, that, so I want to, I do want to talk about you a little bit before we get into the book. And I wanted to, because I want people to read the book. And in that uh, comes the issue of not wanting to talk too much detail, but in order to get the ideas across. So definitely, I, I do want to get there. But reading this, first of all, my dad is one of my best friends. I uh. love him so much. And he's, you know, not a spring chicken. That, that emotional connection really got to me. And then I have issues with my, you know, my childhood growing up with my mom. I saw very, a lot of similarities between your mother and Is my right? mother. Mm -hmm. And, and their relationship. And so there was all that you really can put yourself in it. I could. You being the royal you. But, I have a, number, a lot um, of friends You definitely who. could since it was you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I related to a lot of it. Uh, <laughs> no, I, I have a number of people who have said to me, you know, they either had one parent who was, you know, they they got, they were close to, and the other parent who was not, mother, father, whatever. But It's usually the opposite sex parent that you get along with best. 
Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Huh. I think so. Otherwise, kids would never leave the house. That's what <laughs> <laughs> so, so your dad uh, passed away from ALS, Lou Gehrig's right. disease. Uh, I'm going to see if I can say it right. Amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. Oh, my God. Is that right? Did well, I get I, it? I can't say it. I don't know. <gasps> Oof. I ALS. I <laughs> ALS is much easier. I practiced. <laughs> I, I practiced by going, what did I do? I went, A, my... <laughs> Amy, yeah, very I, good. I, I, try, I, try. I was like, okay, now I've got it. And I'm still fucking up, I'm sure. But whatever. <laughs> anyway, ALS, as it is commonly known. Yeah, um, it's what a, a horrible, it's, fucked up way to die. Oh, it's and it's. I always uh, equate it to to the opposite of uh, Alzheimer's because mm-hmm. your brain, your mind stays perfectly intact, but your body goes away. Okay. Stephen Hawking, for example, a mind he would live forever with that. He well, lived like twenty five years. Good to be rich when you're sick. I get, it helps a lot. It helps with care and stuff. But his body deteriorated, I guess, around. I think he issues. had a breathing tube. He did. Too. He did. Yeah, because that's a, the difference. Yeah. Okay. And your dad didn't want to go into that, or no. He said no because, and I get it. Um, if you have a breathing tube, then the way you die from ALS is the muscle, which, by the way, is how they explained it to my dad at UCLA. Uh, that was a lovely nurse. <laughs> <laughs> Ratchet was it? Might have been. Might have been. I didn't check her name badge, but mm. that would have been. Um, the way you die from uh, ALS is that the, um, the ALS affects the motor neurons between the muscle groups and the spinal column. And when it finally affects the muscles around the lungs, you slowly suffocate to death, which is what they told my dad. And I'm staring at him. It almost sounds funny, but I'm staring at him like, are you... you you fuck you really fucking have to say that to him seriously really because i can send him out of the room you can say whatever you want to me but you yeah <laughs> there's a hilarious chapter about that ucla in there yeah <clears throat> that surprised me i yeah me too i was shocked at there. the level of um or lack of level of compassion on that one and yeah, yeah, I think I called it nin compoopery. There was a line that you said in the book <laughs> that I, I resonated with so much, and it was, um, I'm going to not quote it exactly, obviously, but it's linked to the view of, of um, all the shit that we get thrown at us, yeah. and we do all the things we can to, to yeah, work it out. Yeah, you think you're doing the right thing. And we all end up in the same place, obviously, anyway, but, <laughs> yeah. you know, I mean, and they don't know what causes it yet. No. And they don't know how to stop it. Yeah. Which, how do you wrap your head around that? And in the book, you talk about yeah. um, friends of yours who were younger that experienced it. Yeah, and not friends, but people we people met we when we. Yeah. yeah. There was a woman that a young a woman that died. In a, I don't want to give the book away, but. Um, That's right. There's. Yeah. A lot of stuff in it, so. It's so good. Um, I really thank enjoyed you it. Very and it, I mean, it's clear that you're a writer because of the. I, what saved me because I, I would start to cry and then you had this this levity that would bring me back out again and it was wonderful <laughs> oh, and a bit um, that was the hardest part for me was because when I said about doing I start you know I started doing it because of my sons because they didn't understand what was going on so I figured I'd write this but the hardest part for me in the beginning was figuring out how to you know it's a story about a guy who gets a a fatal disease and then he eventually dies I mean there's got to be something more uplifting to the story and more entertaining than just fading away <laughs> death is easy comedy is hard yes <laughs> that's really true too my uncle died uh, last year of cancer a, a particular kind of cancer it was a, a weird hybrid leukemia and uh, it was, it's something in the brain as well. Okay. And uh, that combination is a death sentence. Oh. Um, and for his sons, it was, they, they, I could tell there's a lot of anger, there's a lot of fear, and they had a lot of trouble, I think, leaning into the, their father dying. But for me, when I came to visit Uncle Gene, the guy was hugging on him and loving on him and it's it's weird that I could lean into the dying part and take some of it away and I feel that your dad was so lucky in that in this horrible moment 
he actually started living this gorgeous life. Uh, yeah. You know, there was so much love and people go an entire lifetime and not experience what he yeah. was able to experience for, even though it was so short and it sucks and why couldn't he live to see, you know, your sons grow up and get married and things like that. Yeah. But there is something too I thought it was really beautiful to watch you all lean into his dying because so many people can't do that. Yeah. It's really, it's a precious thing. It's, it's a remarkable experience to, and you know, I said in there, my brother didn't take part in it. He's nine years older than I. And uh, I think I said in the afterward that I heard from him because he read the part about himself. And didn't take it very well, I guess. Didn't. <laughs> He's always been a drama I queen. I cleaned that from. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, yeah, he sent me a text and he basically said, well, I read more of your book and this is the last you'll ever hear from me. Something like that. Well, I have a surprise for you. He's here now. Come on. <laughs> no, my aunt said she had a conversation with him just after my dad died. And, you know, he said, well, maybe I'm a coward. I don't know if I put this in the book. I edited it many times sure. to make it nicer. Mm. And he, so he had this conversation with my aunt, who was with my dad for the last three months of his life. Um, his sister and uh, she said uh, that she talked to my brother Phil and sa and he said uh, look maybe I'm a coward but I couldn't stand to see dad that way um, and she told me that story and I said well, I got to agree with him. He's a coward. Is your brother much like your mom? I think so. He recognizes that and hates himself for it. So. That's hard because self-loathing is probably the worst kind. You yeah, know? yeah. You have siblings? I have two older brothers. I have a uh, full-blooded brother, Jeremy, and a half-brother, Matthew. Are we okay with them? Uh, yeah. I mean, I didn't really grow up with Matt, so my knowledge of him came much later in life. Right. Um, as far as interaction and stuff. Uh, he's funny and punny and he had an, uh, a very severe drug problem growing up and uh, going into his 20s and things and had a massive aneurysm that robbed him of his frontal lobe, right frontal lobe and um, his, How personal that, his personality got aces. When he was in his coma, I said to my dad, who me, because he was, if you're listening, Matt, it's true, he was a right jackass. He was just a, not a very nice person. Brilliant, not nice. And when he was in his coma, I said to my dad, what if he comes out of the coma and it's like eating away all the dickhead part, you know? And it did. It did? Yeah. He's Were lovely. you in the room when you said that? Were you in the room with him? With Matt? No. Oh, okay. When Close. he came out of his coma, he asked for a dragon meat sandwich and he thought it was 1897. Really? Mm-hmm. That could be a great story. Mm -hmm. Cool, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and then my big brother Jeremy. Wow. Um, he, I like to say he he's my dad and I are very close, but growing up, dad was always working. Mom was a handful for a lot of reasons, and uh, so Jeremy really was my surrogate parent, mm -hmm. and I adore Jeremy, and and he is just he's a good guy. When he had children, I knew he'd be a good dad because he was a great dad to me. Uh. You know. And I needed it at the time because yeah. for lots of stuff, you know. And what, what's your mom's deal? Uh, or can we talk about illness. that? We don't oh yeah, it's fine. Oh. She's um, borderline personality, uh, mm. manic depressive. All right. Yeah, uh, she had troubles with alcohol throughout my childhood. She doesn't really. She doesn't. She drinks in social events ish now, but you know, as a as many people with depression do, she self medicated. You know. That's what I'm doing. Okay. Amen, brother. <laughs> <laughs> I like to say, if you're not depressed right now, you're not paying attention. <laughs> That's it. I was just going to say, pay attention. <laughs> Open a newspaper. I think that's what they call, quote unquote, environmental depression. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. But anyway, so yeah, that was, that was my situation. Wow. And I'm also very odd. I was, my parents like to joke growing up that I was the alien they found under a rock. Because I'm just, I'm different than the family, which is fine. Yeah. You know, but it's weird to be different. You don't yeah. know where you are until yeah. you realize that you get to be everywhere or nowhere and it's all good, you know. That's great. That's yeah. a nice way to, I'm glad you're 
I'm glad you're there <laughs> oh, at that. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Took a long time. Oh, Some yeah. Decent therapy. God yeah. Knows. Yeah. Yeah. This therapy mental mm. shit. Last, I will tell you, this is this is kind of funny. The last I had a I had a cycle of depression about three years ago. The first in 25 years. And so I went to, I started seeing this doctor in Encino, an older guy, and he put me on some new medication, which is, you know, ultimately what, <laughs> what does it, because I'm kind of lost faith in talk therapy, because you can just talk in circles till you're blue in the face. Um, so anyway, he's an older guy, and he had some odd theories, but, you know, I'm like, I don't know, you know, I'm I'm a marshmallow at that stage. I'll take anything. But he had, he had a little bit of trouble hearing. And, and he wouldn't get a hearing aid. So I'd say something like, something like uh, really deep and personal. Uh, what um, I, 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 I dreamed I... Uh, made love to my mother last night and my father uh, um, uh, masturbated in front of me. You know, it was really weird. And he'd go, what? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. That's awful and amazing. And I'd get, and then you go, well, okay. I, I dreamed last night oh, God. that I was having sex with my mother and, my, and he says, you're going to have to speak up. Okay. my dad, And I'm yelling this, <laughs> these really intimate, I will absolutely use this as a character sometime. Please do. But, <laughs> and I kept thinking, like, if you have, a like, an insurance office right next door. Oh, yeah. And well, or keep, the waiting room or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> you keep hearing people who are yelling these really personal things it would it would kind of you would have to it's like the airplane uh, the airplanes you just have to stop and listen for a little while so crazy <laughs> oh my god there's so many uh fucked up uh people who are in the therapeutic therapy side yes yeah i agree yeah. i mean that's that human condition of wanting to know oneself and the easier yeah. it's easier to look outward than to look inward and so that's where people go naturally. Yeah, and they yeah they get interested in it too because it applies yeah. to them and and they don't know they're they are probably mirroring all along and little by little hopefully yeah. sewing up their own patchwork but they may or may not be doing that. Yeah, <laughs> you're looking at me like okay, no, I, you're absolutely right. I you know <laughs> I've been looked at worse. <laughs> <laughs> You have written for a multitude of television shows, um, and I'm sure people ask you about it all the time. I'm going to list the shows in the preamble so that I don't bore you with your own details. Oh. But I am curious, um, of all this, the stories, lines you've written, all this stuff, is there a particular sketch or, or scene that really pops up to the surface that's either love it or hate it? Well, I did write a... No. It, that wasn't you? I have to pour my wine this way because it paces me, and that that's it for the evening. Oh, all right. Um, you don't have to do that. I've, I've just never filled seen it. it in a hat with a straw before. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot where we started. Do you remember where we started? You said you like to pace and... Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. There was something before that, but it must not have been. What we were talking about before you started pace. Uh, I asked you of your um, of the shows oh, you've shows, written. Shows, the, things or, that I liked. Yes. I don't know. There's one. There was. I don't know. I don't know. There. Um. That's hard to say. I. Yeah, I imagine. I hate it when people ask me what my favorite song I've written is. It's an. What impossible is your favorite question. song? It's an impossible question. I. Oh, it seems like you could. Uh, I. I like Birdie a lot. You should. Yeah, I like that song. That's um, my favorite. Oh, thank you. I've listened to two. Ah, I appreciate <laughs> it, and I do like Lonely. Lo I like too. I like Lonely because I think it, uh, I think it tells a good story. You know, songwriting is miniature story writing, so. Yeah, it's. Um, the three-minute movie is what we like to call it in the songwriting room. It's. Um, yeah, we were talking about this uh, earlier, and and it's fascinating to me. Cause, I mean, I taught for a while at uh, USC and. At writing um, television writing but I was talking to um, um, I love 
young, enthusiastic writers who just have that. Um, They're the best in bed. Okay. Is that right? <laughs> I mean, That's a that great out. idea. <laughs> <laughs> we will not get that rumor started. I'm just going to cut that out. But I could not say that. <laughs> I had to give that a try. Um, I had to give that a try. <laughs> I'm thinking about sleeping with younger writers. Um, uh, all right, we're making a joke now about my old psychiatrist. <laughs> and when I say old psychiatrist, uh, um, Songs. Songs, stories, younger writers, and I love that. I love it when they're, you know, you're just this pie-eyed. You know they're wrong because they're so pie-eyed, but I just love it. And so, you know, uh, I have, I guess you could say I mentor a little bit, and and I had a conversation today with one, and, and we, were, we were talking about the little right and left brain. Mm -hmm. You know that when you're creating, when you're coming up with something, you just well, this happens when you're writing a joke or when you're coming up with a story is you let the I forget which side of the brain does what um, I think the right is the creative and the left is the uh, cognitive yeah more okay it's the side yeah that side mathematical I, when you're in a writer's room you know the the uh, um, mood that it, you try to create is is that anything goes that there's no in fact I worked with I worked for somebody who was my assistant many years before that uh, <laughs> and then my boss which is uh, you know another thing I love about this business is it's like you know it's catch as catch can and everybody but anyway she you know she started every uh, every other session by saying if if you if you don't pitch something Something stupid you're not working you know and a lot of writers do this too they'll say well this may not work or this is a really stupid idea but and you pitch it out and you know sometimes it gets a laugh sometimes it doesn't someone you know you go you realize not nah, really is a stupid idea or maybe but that's what it is is you let anything go you explore any avenue and it's so absolutely different from the um, mathematical the, analytical mind mm -hmm. yeah, and then once you yeah. have something yeah. or several five or six absurd ideas you go over to the other side of your brain and figure out which one is the most logical and which one works and then you flip back the other way when you get to another stage you know all this from well, I mean it's very much like songwriting but I think it's yeah. fascinating I, I've never written a television show you know and I do think that there's something to be said about trying to sneak past the sentinel, you know? Because the sentinel's like, don't say that, you sound like an idiot, or don't say that. Mm -hmm. Everyone else in the room's gonna, you know, is smarter than you, or whatever, yeah. and you have to yeah. wait till the sentinel is, you know, pulling up his pants or something, and then go whoosh, get right past. Yeah. It's a lot of getting out of your well, ego's Well, and what's, what's hard for some in, in this day and age is kind of difficult, but in a writer's room, I think it's really important that anything goes. And Oh, you mean with the Me Too stuff? Well, sometimes with the Me Too stuff because you know, someone can tell a blowjob joke in the room and it it's funny because it's a blowjob joke and it's like everybody's dying. And then you go somebody goes, "Well, wait a minute." What if it's not, you know, you're talking about your characters now. You go, what if it's not a blowjob? What if this is a first kiss? And you apply the same story structure to the first kiss and the same tensions. And you have the beginning, possibly, of a story. And some of the stuff that just absolutely cracks people up in a, in a writer's room. And if you've ever seen um, the, the Aristocrats. <laughs> yeah, it's great. That's what comedy writers find funny is right. the stuff that goes way, way over, <laughs> way, way over the line. line. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, I do. It's it's tricky, you know. There's not a lot of room for being precious when you're just trying to get ideas out. I mean, I've said in some of my rooms we can get filthy. Yeah, you know, and it's fun and it's funny, and but not everybody is down for that conversation, and my 
suggestion and I think that sometimes when people when I go to a comedy show I love stand-up comedy when I go to a comedy show and there's that one person in the audience with their arms crossed and uh, their face yeah. bunched up and they're pissed because the comic has brought up something personal to them or whatever yeah. or just an observation my I can, all I can think of ever is like why would you go to a comedy show if you yeah. know especially for comics that aren't that run blue it's just like don't, why would you subject yourself to that if yeah. you are I'm a celiac so I'm not gonna go to the dinner table and eat all the dinner rolls that would be stupid <laughs> I, so this whole thing about I think people love to be angry anymore and again yeah. I've said this a million times on this show is I truly believe that people are so angry because as you're, if you're angry you're loud and if you're loud you don't get to hear your own thoughts yeah I, you know what I was just going to say that yeah. I've never thought that before yeah. but I was just going to say that from you what get you said quiet and you hear what so you, you're, as soon as you start yelling about yourself you forget about your own insecurities and you don't have to ever look inward you know the whole dagger out thing that old story about oh if you're pointing the finger you've got three fingers pointing oh, back yeah, at you but yeah. it's the same idea yeah I, uh, yeah, I it's absolutely the same as in my uh, lovers they come together in the beginning of a relationship and they love oh I love it his nose whistles a little bit when he eats it's the best it's so <laughs> cute and then flash forward five years later and they're plotting the murder of yeah. the person do you need to whistles. eat like that exactly the thing that we adore and love in a person in the beginning that is so novel and, and whatever and cute is the thing we loathe at the end because we're mirroring so if I'm getting pissed at somebody for something they're saying or doing or whatever and this is a gross generalization but it's getting the point across then it's likely something that's in yeah. me yeah. you know but yeah, people I, aren't very good at self that's, I, I mean I have a what? at self observations uh, well I, I mean I have a, I really do have a problem with that because in a writer's room this is the environment I I guess I came to maturity and but I, I mean I'm a, a depressive you know everybody who's my friend close friend knows that that's something I've that's why you're funny though well yeah I, I'm not being I mean I'm, I, I'm no, not being I, flippant I'm being serious <laughs> I, I think that people with it's very common among well artists yes yeah. and it's very common among uh, especially stand-ups but comedy people but um uh Siri in a, agrees <laughs> Siri just Who does? Up. Siri. <laughs> she just turned I on. I didn't... Really? <laughs> she did. I didn't say anything. She just went just, beep beep. Don't get me started. Uh, in the writer's room. Um, no, it, it's an environment where... Um, you know, uh, 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 black guys, uh, lesbians, gays, um, women, men, um, everybody who's anything that when you're sitting in a writer's room, everybody makes fun of everybody. And that's just the nature of it. So you have to really be careful when you leave the writer's room. I'll tell you one that's great. A friend of mine, Mike Langworthy, one of the funniest, most brilliant guys I know. Um, he was a um, he was a lawyer for 10 years, decided screw it, he became a stand-up comic he's in the book yeah oh yeah so i told you in the book about his joke he says to me we're uh somebody asked me about the book i was writing and and he knew that my dad could no longer speak and so i said yeah i was just going you know it's just kind of um you know telling the, the stories that happened in the year and a half my dad was around me and Mike says, as we're walking to the stage one day, he says, well, so what's the last chapter? Just gurgling? Oh, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> and I, <laughs> you know, I thought it was the funniest thing because there's something about a joke like that j that just reaches it pops over the... the what's that? It pops the, the balloon. It pops the balloon, yes. Yeah. And, and it says, I know that you know that... I love you or care about you or that I, you know, that mm -hmm. here's this joke. Yeah. He also said, <laughs> this was, <laughs> he has very dark, uh, he gets in a lot of trouble. Like a Jesselneck humor? Yeah. Anthony, I love Anthony <laughs> So dark. Yeah. He, uh, what was it? Um, 
Oh, my cat had just disappeared, and uh, I think that coyotes had gotten him, and living up in the canyon over there, and and um, and everybody <laughs> knew this was on Sybil, and everybody knew that Russ was just walking around like numb, like just a zombie, and and. <laughs> <laughs> so we're sitting around one day and Mike comes in and he says oh yeah I said, I said I just drove over the canyon and I could have sworn I heard coyotes belching oh. <laughs> and I like I just like as soon as I understood as soon as I got it I'm like it was like the first time all day that I just started laughing everybody else is like frozen waiting to see <laughs> what I'm going to do and uh, I don't know people equate humor with disdain and it's not it's not it's a way to cope if you if we didn't have humor we'd fall off the fucking planet you know and we need it so much nowadays and you know yeah, yeah. I agree this is what my friend's book is about that humor or no, darkness. it's about, <laughs> it's like, it's uh, 1984. The book starts in 2016, and you follow it through to 2035. And it's about how he, do, he never names, he never uses the word Trump, but he talks about the great leader. And the, the election of 2020 is called off because they doubt the veracity of the voting machines and it is postponed for two years and then all these other things are implemented and you just follow this family through this this 1984 experience yeah. I, i'm going to suggest he call it 2084 oh that's a good idea and do it as an old man's memory <laughs> that's a great idea i don't know but it's a brilliant book and he's a just an absolutely brilliant writer name? rick dresser Rick he is a playwright. What what plays might I have? Uh, he had one that was made into two that were made made into a movie. Uh, Below the, the belt. Movie? No. Oh. Different. Movies. <laughs> Somebody thought they could do it better. Yeah, it became a big fight. Poor Rick, right in the middle. Um, Below the belt. Below the belt. Uh, one about baseball. He has. He's had a bunch of. He's a. He's a really well known playwright. Okay. And I worked with him on a couple of TV shows. One the, where I met him was on a show called Smoldering Lust with my mentor Jay Tarsus. That's the name of a real show. It was absolutely it. on NBC. Smoldering was Lust. Was it a soap opera? No, it was a, a half hour. Um, but it, but it was an ongoing story, and it was this was like in the early '90s. But it was an ongoing story about a murder mystery. Ooh. It was Bradley Whitford and Kate oh. Capshaw, Spielberg's uh, squeeze. Yeah, I love Bradley Whitford. So smart. Oh, he's the greatest. She's guy. great too, but I just think he's he's so funny. Yeah, he's, he's really great. a funny guy. Um, yeah, uh, and I just loved that show because it was. I'll have to look that up. Yeah, yeah, uh, it's hard to find because it got kind of squelched by the network. Uh, Warren Littlefield was the head of NBC at the time, and they never liked it. And the story goes that no, I shouldn't tell this story. I will tell another one though. Because um, when I went to work with Jay, Jay Tarsus wrote um, The New Heart Show and Buffalo sure. Bill. Um, and <laughs> his writing, you read his scripts and it's like reading Joseph Heller at his height. I mean, Jay is consistent. And R Jay and Rick are, you know, comparable. Um, but Jay has always been a mentor to me, which would, he, I always, I told him, I said, you know, that I, I say that he, he would eat his liver to think he's a mentor to anybody. Um, funniest guy on the earth. Um, but, and his writing is so, so brilliant. But he, uh, when I came to work with him at um, Smoldering Lust, I worked with him first on Slap Maxwell, which was probably my fa most favorite show to work on with Dabney Coleman and um, nobody else really of, of note, um, Megan Gallagher. I don't who's think I know who that is. Wonderful. Yeah, a lot of people who really deserve to do better than they 
than they did. Um, but th when I first w went to work for him, uh, she's on this probably show. never heard of me either, so it's okay. <laughs> I'll check. I don't know. I don't know. Don't sell yourself short. Uh, so, uh, uh, no, I, and I said his daughter, Jay Tarsus's daughter, became a network executive. When I first went to work on Smoldering Lust, um, uh, uh, which was, uh, was such, a, such a funny show, um, but uh, I asked Jay because he had just done a, a show, uh, I, think, I think it was uh, one of the other networks called Baltimore. And his daughter became a network executive, uh, one of the top, Jamie Tarsus. And I think if at birth Jay had a choice between choosing which direction his offspring would go, like a network executive or an official with the Nazi SS, and he, Jay's Jewish, so he'd have trouble oh, deciding. Dear. Sophie's choice. <laughs> 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 That's brilliant. Um, um, so his his you too. The dog is scratching her. So at least she's not licking herself. Which I got to We know when we have company. I go, George. Don't be please. jealous. It's just well. <laughs> okay, there's a few ways to go with that, and I'm not gonna. Um, uh, so, no, I said, so, Jay, Baltimore, what happened with Baltimore? And Jay said, well, the official word from the network was, it's not your best work, Dad. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> wow. He, uh, That's cold. His whole life is so funny. Hi, baby. Is she, oh, she's licking. I my dog is, is now licking Susan's head. That's right. So, which I was doing earlier, but, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I was, like, getting tired. Yeah. And, well, I mean, to be fair, you so, just met me. First the butt sniff. It, that's, the, I mean, it's protocol. It's awkward now. And with the Me Too, the whole Me Too thing, mm, the true. butt sniff thing is just... It's off the table. It's tough. Mm -hmm. It's tough on us old guys who yeah. are used to norms. And I feel bad because I expressed my anal glands on your chair. I'm so sorry. <laughs> oh, my God. You really could... You really could be in a writer's room. I would love that. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, so, yeah. So, um, oh, God, the stories about Jay Tarsus are endless, but they're so funny. Oh, my God. One, he he's always he's always been um, when when we had to take meetings at NBC, we'd go to this. It was me and him. It was before Rick Dresser ended up on the show. Um, and we would go to this huge mahogany, I don't know, marble office at NBC, and it's huge with the huge things and the table with the, and it's huge and it's Warren Littlefield and and Jay just he's a perfect example of the opposite of a Hollywood. He's 80 now, which kills me, but he's a perfect example because he what he does in his life is. He shits on the people above him, and he sucks up and treats with respect the people below him. The absolute opposite of how it's done in this town. And I've seen, and I went to meetings with him, and we would go into this meeting with the network execs and Warren Littlefield and all these execs in their suits and their things and stuff. And Jay would walk, and he'd kick off his shoes, and he'd sit on the floor, and he'd be chewing gum. And he, somebody would say something like, uh, "We we don't understand why this character is doing this or that." And Jay would say, "Well." That's who they are. That's what they do. I mean, do you have a better fucking idea? Because that doesn't make any sense to me. Why Why do we have to question all this? And <laughs> I started saying, what Jay means to say is, well, certainly consider your idea. <laughs> and I started getting laughs with that. But, and then I saw him many times, but he was always so kind to everybody who worked for him. He'd walk, I remember one time we were in a meeting, in the middle of the meeting, he heard that one of the production assistants had never eaten a tomato. And we went a little further in the meeting and he goes, well, hold on, this, why? And then he asked the person in the room, 
Why? What do you mean she never ate a tomato? Well, she's, I don't know, how old is she? She's like, I don't know, 24, 25. And, and so he gets, in the middle of the meeting, he gets up and he walks to the outer office and and he goes out and he sits down and I, I, was, I went out with him and I just wanted to listen. And he sat down there for, for like 30 or 40 minutes just questioning her like, really why why have you never eaten a tomato and she said I don't know I just never wanted to I never had any interest and he said but you, what about holidays you, does your family do they make and he just went through this list of questions and I can't do it justice but it's the funniest line of questioning you would have ever heard in your life one other quick one, and then I'll get off the subject. But he um, so Jay's wife is is just the sweetest person in the world. She works for the Red Cross, and she was having a party at the house one night. And these are legendary stories in Hollywood about Jay Tarsus because he's famous among comedy writers. Um, but there, she's having this party, and the Red Cross people, and I don't know, Jay always feels uncomfortable around these people, and so. They're having the party. The party's in, in, full, in full swing. And, and Rachel realizes Jay is nowhere to be found. And she says to her other daughter, um, is Jay here? And she, sh and she says, well, his, his uh, car is in the driveway. I don't know. And so she looks, her daughter looks through the house, can't find him. And she comes back and says, I, I can't, he's not here. And Rachel says, oh, all right. So she goes looking and she goes into their bedroom and she opens up the closet door and Jay is, <laughs> is in the closet with a flashlight sitting on a box sorting out his baseball cards. <laughs> and, you know, he was in his mid-60s at the time and you go, oh my God, I love this That's guy. That's so quirky, I love it. I love this guy, yeah. Humans are characters. Yeah, yeah. That is, I think, one of the greatest uh, losses that humans have is that they, you know, they're spending so much time on their phones that they're missing all this crazy shit going on around them. Yeah. The people watching, it's yeah. extraordinary. I agree. And I agree. the tiniest little moments happen. And if you're looking down on your phone, and I know phones are useful, of course. I'm not yeah. saying that they're not, but there's so much going on. I've seen so many misconnections walking on the street and watching people walk by. And I think to myself, what if, what if that was the moment? Yeah. And they missed it. Yeah. And then I think, do they go home and the rest of the day they have a, a weird aching that they can't quite put their finger on and it's because oh, that's, yeah. they cross the path of it gives me the shivers they, they cross the path of the person and see you you should write a story like that I, I write lots of stuff I mean I oh you do oh yeah, yeah I write stuff down all the time I thought you just wrote songs no I I have piles of Jesus ideas and God and what, what my the hell brain is, is with like, you I don't know. <laughs> So, so you, Alien. you write, produce, sing, and do songs. You do these podcasts. You do Paint. paintings that yeah, are abstract. beautiful. Thank you. And you must go to, to the website and see these paintings. Susanruth.com. All right. Lab rat subjected to hopeless scenarios. That was the line that I was like, oh, that's such a good line. What is it? Lab rat subject, subjected to hopeless scenarios. That's in your book. Such a good line. Oh, God. Oh, yeah, I remember that part of it. <laughs> yeah, that was you. Here's his other... This, oh, yeah. This is a sculpture's arm. He is saying... I, see, he looked like he was probably saying, fuck you. I yeah. I by the expression on this Jack Palance face. Yeah, yeah. Uh, That's Susan great. was uh, interestingly compared to this uh, creature to Jack Palance, and I see it now yeah, that I it never changed. saw it before. Yeah. I see things in things a lot, though. I, I take bet. pictures of stuff, and I'm... That's why I do that a lot on my Instagram, and I say, doesn't this look like blah? And then people say, oh, I see this or that. I love that. But yeah, SusanRuth.com is where my paintings can be. Some of my paintings can be found. SusanRuth.com. Su are you related to Babe? No. Oh, mm -hmm. oh I'm sorry. I'm so okay. sorry. Sweet little pig, though. Love the movie. Okay. My friend Rick Dresser wrote a stage play about Babe Ruth. Oh, really? Yeah, it's brilliant. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, go to SusanRuth.com <laughs> because those paintings are beautiful. Thank I'm serious. You. I really appreciate that. I'm serious. I have no reason to blow smoke up your ass. 
Not now. I've already come in the door. <laughs> no, I know. We had that whole thing that earlier, whole thing, yeah. so who cares about <laughs> blowing smoke? What was the first show that you wrote for that was not as a PA but actual writer, where you first stepped into the writer's room? Um, I think it was uh, Valerie. Okay. Valerie Do you remember that? No, Valerie uh, Harper. Harper. Oh, okay. She just passed away. Yes, she did. Right? Yeah. 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 Uh, it was a, I, uh, it was not a, I had no idea what I was doing. It was uh, not a good experience. And I was just going through a, well, I was going through a depressive cycle. T so I was like, you know, a vegetable. And, and. So they hit you hard. Yeah. 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 Um, and un unfor for unfortunately, uh, they were really good friends of mine who were running the show. And when they finally came after 20 weeks and said, you know, this isn't working out, I was so relieved, you know, because I no longer, I didn't feel like I was letting my friends down anymore. And I was, I was able to kind of go home and re recoup and mm. recover and stuff. But yeah, it was, it was hard. Do you think your mom suffered from depression? That was yes. part of her. Okay. Yeah, and she, I, I guess the way that she, and I, I understand, I guess, that a lot of people react this way to depression with anger and outbursts and hostility. Um, it's never been, <laughs> never been my case. I kind of wish it was because, uh, <laughs> because I can't do anything except shut down. Yeah, just be a, a vegetable. Um, but uh, yeah, she she definitely did, and it was uh, um, so for in my situation is biological, and then the environment I grew up in with her certainly. When you know. your mom got sick, and you, so it's such a bizarre. The truth is always stranger than fiction, of course. Um, that she was passing away just as you're learning about your father's illness and that all of that transpired uh, with your, your father and, and your family likely wouldn't have happened if your mom had been alive. I'm sorry, yeah. my LSD is kicking in. <laughs> Pardon me. Yeah, she's grabbing bugs now and, yeah. and I just throwing saw mosquitoes. them. Those little fuckers love me and I... Yeah, no, I... I, I well, I hope I really hope there are mosquitoes here now, because um, if not, That's oh, you bat. can't have mosquitoes are big trouble for you. Is that right? With no, your... I just don't like I don't like them. They oh, bite me, okay. and I don't enjoy that. That's probably offensive to a lot of the people out there. A lot of the mosquitoes, mosquitoes listening. I have a yeah. small group of mosquitoes that listen. They write in diligently. They all they're all in Guam. All right. Anyway, you know I think we got off track. <laughs> I think we did a little uh. bit. Anyway, so let's start over. <laughs> With your mom's illness, and she that came on quickly, and then she was hospitalized. She was I never long? really understood my mom's illness because I never <laughs> I never really wanted to get that close to it. Uh, not for any biological reasons. I just didn't. You didn't have that relationship. I didn't care. Yeah. <laughs> I'm right. sorry, that sounds so it's cruel. It's truth. It's not true. I mean, it's not true. It's true. And it's not untrue. All right. Um, you no, I... You out in the next lifetime. <laughs> yeah, I, when I first found out that she was sick and she was going into the hospital, um, I got the, you know, I got the call from my parents' neighbor because my dad couldn't, who was starting to lose his ability to speak. But didn't know why. Yeah. Yeah, at first point. we thought it was uh, loose dentures, and then we thought maybe a small stroke, and then by then, um, by the time we got the diagnosis, I think it was the same week that my mother died. But she died unexpectedly. They, you know, it was a bleeding ulcer or something like that, and by the time, when she died, I think it was three days after my dad was diagnosed one way or the other so she never even heard the diagnosis no no she wouldn't have been able to deal with it and i th thank god if that's the right thing to say that she was never a part of it because she could not have dealt with it and she would have been angry that i was stepping in See, things like that make me wonder about the universe at large. That mm. here she is unable to deal with that scenario. And so she leaves. 
You know, that, I never thought of it exactly in those terms, but that could very well be. And giving your father a beautiful way to spend the last year and a half of his life. A horrible, Well, now you're beautiful. crediting her with generosity of spirit. Well, let's take her human self out of it, and let's just say there's something larger at work. Who knows if there is or not? But if there were, that would be the time to do it. Right? All right. Well, you talk about... Are you on her side or mine? I'm not on anyone's side. All right. Okay. But you talk about... Um, there's a psychic that you talk to. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and that your mother apologizes. Yes. And I thought that was really interesting. It, I thought it was, yeah, fascinating. Fascinating. Because um, what if this is all a bunch of bullshit? We're just acting out some bizarro video game and... I kind of think that's you know, what we we're doing. We step out of this mortal coil into the realm of the all things, then we get the joke, finally. You know? Yeah. Well, not finally. We get back and we understand it again. And then, and then we, we say, let's try back. that again. That was horrifying. Yeah, I've had enough of a break. <laughs> come back for, uh, I'm going to come back for a little more misery. Yeah. Definitely um, eating bread in my next life. Anyway, so, <laughs> so when you got the diagnosis with your dad from that lovely nurse, mm. who, uh, doctor, sorry, the, the doctor was the one that gave the diagnosis. The, the nurse was the one that put yeah. it in no one's No, they terms. were both doctors. There was oh. the one doctor, Graves. This was a guy who, who specialized specializes in a terminal illness you think I mean I had a, a the joke teacher is not lost what's that the joke is not lost for sure <laughs> no I had a, 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 a teacher in junior high school named he was a math math teacher his name was was Dick Head oh poor thing Richard Head and I'm thinking like okay that's your name that's what your parents did to you okay don't teach junior high school or when you turn 18 maybe change your name or yeah <laughs> yes or figures <laughs> so yeah so this so the same thing with this guy it's like uh, graves is you find another field uh, dermatology maybe yeah which might scare <laughs> <laughs> yeah there's still some good skin cancer so i'll take you right out when your your dad did so he was of the generation that didn't talk about all the feeling things and all the stuff yeah, things and yeah. all that and yet so much love at least you wrote him that way so much love poured off of him and the the fact that ted danson took to him so much oh, and yeah. everybody at becker i mean when i was reading that whole thing about the photograph i i was a blur. <laughs> so beautiful it was really uh <laughs> i was amazed throughout the whole experience how people colleagues of mine just stepped up and and did I thought I, you know I suppose not heroic gigantic leap things but they did s things that weren't expected of them and they did so many generous things for him it was so sweet it's the leaning in I yeah it's I think the leaning so in and it's there's such a vulnerability in leaning into death because the one thing we fear is our mortality. Yeah. It's our biggest fear, right? Yeah. And so for people that are able to give a little nod to death standing in the corner with his scythe and his cloak right. and say, got you, I understand, but let me just have this moment with this yeah. person yeah. in deference or in... Right. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. And so many people did that with your dad. Oh. Well, and I... And your kids. That oh, was really God. fun. I, 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 there's just so much going on as far as the meta conversation of, you know, these <laughs> little kids and then a, a man who's leaving the world and they're just starting and learning and he's teaching them all these things. And it's it's very active, but there's also so much going on underneath the surface. Yeah. What isn't being said, which, of course, is always the loudest conversation. <laughs> oh, that's uh, great. I never heard that saying I before. That's it. great. I think I just made it up. but <laughs> I think you should tattoo that. That's good. <laughs> I'm getting it a tattooed on my shoulder tomorrow well, i'm gonna <laughs> next time i have to speak somewhere i'm gonna say i'll be your speech writer there you go uh, uh, someone i know said this uh, no how can i just take credit myself <laughs> most people do <laughs> <laughs> your brother's sister who had, and i picture if my brother was diagnosed with a terminal disease i would drop everything because i worship him he's a great yeah. he's a great guy and my father the same and even 
my mother, I suppose, although we've had our situations. I remember when I was younger, um, there was a breast cancer scare and there's a lot of un With your mom? Mm -hmm. There's a lot of stuff that has not ever been dealt with. She's a tricky, tricky person. Mm. And uh, I remember hearing about the fact that she might have breast cancer and thinking, oh, what does that mean? And I was surprised how hard it hit me. And I think it's- Really? Yeah, and I think it was because of all the things unsaid. Yeah. We're so scared of each other. Really? I think so. Yeah. I get that. Mm hmm I get that. Yeah. That's interesting. I... How did your this, father's death... How did that... Where, where are you with death because of your father passing away before your eyes? I was... It was not... This is going to sound weird to say. It wasn't tremendously um, overwhelming to me. I finally sat down and cried on Ventura Boulevard. Um, but I was so... I was relieved... I think a lot of people have said this before. I was relieved that he was done with all this. And... and um, it was... I felt like I had gotten a year and a half an extraordinary year and a half that who gets to have a year and a half like that even if you love your parent and you get to spend that time with them I won't say get to but you spend that time with them while they're dying we we did a television show about him and then we went to you know we go to this this black tie event at the muscular dystrophy thing where Ted Danson and the cast of this TV show and me and stand on a stage and tell him how much we love him across this sea of black ties and gowns and all this stuff and who gets to do that and I just felt like by the end I don't know there's nothing I could there's no more you could ever expect from an experience and you know, aside from, there's an incident in there where the, the firefighter comes up to, this guy who was a firefighter in the 9-11, um, uh, and he went into the buildings, and he actually came out with some survivors, and he came up to my dad, and he said this, these, these tremendous things, um, is probably one of the pinnacle moments of my life to just stand beside that and to, to, to see that happen. But the other is... And this is what I mean about some recognizing moments. Um, because he was, because we knew he was dying, he knew he was dying, I knew he was dying. We had these, you know, these prosaic moments where you're watching TV. And he was a World War II vet, and he was a Marine, and he was a. Mm, mm, mm. But we'd be watching TV, and he'd reach over and he'd just hold my hand. And you go, that doesn't happen unless time, you realize, is compressed. And you love each other and you have to acknowledge, you have to acknowledge it. And it's, those, I think those are the only moments that, those are the moments you have to be able to recognize. And then to not only recognize them, but to hold on to them, to put them into your brain and in a little compartment in there that's special. How long ago did your dad pass away now? He was, uh, what was it, 2002. So, 17. Are your sons maintaining their memory of him? They, they right after he died, a few years after they died, he died, they would ask me questions and stuff. But Henry's read the book, and Joe will. Um, and I probably... <laughs> I'm getting of an age sometimes where I repeat stories and, you know, so they've, I think they've heard most of the stories about grandpa. Um, mm -hmm. So, um, but he was right out here when we got the ashes back and I said to Joe and Henry, they've, you know, they cremate and they, they send a box back to your house. And um, I said to Henry and Joe, I said, well, we got to send these to the, our aunt who's going to send them to take them to Texas but 
let's take a little for ourselves. And we stood right there and um, we each took a handful and we toss, uh, no, 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 we each took a handful and we put them in our own bag, uh, three handfuls into the, this one bag. And then we clapped our hands out over the thing. And, and I said to each boy as they did it, I said, say something to grandpa. And it was, you know, it's a stupid little moment, but it was so sweet. I mean, it was so sweet. And, and they remember a lot of it. Um, but, you know, I wanted them to really get the big picture and so much of the stuff they did. I mean, the book serves to me to remind me how funny these little guys were. And Yeah, they're great characters in the book. <laughs> they're really sure. funny. Yeah. Really funny. And I'm happy to say now at whatever they are, 22 and 24, they are decent human beings. And that's all I ever cared about. I didn't care if they become... <laughs> I'd love if they were garbage men and they loved their job. Good humans. All I ever cared about was that they grew up and became decent human beings, kind human beings, and they are that. You can sense that. I love that. I don't want to give it away because I want people to read it, but the, the bicycle story is hilarious. <laughs> and you get such a strong sense of their personalities throughout <laughs> that as well. Are you working on another book right now? Uh, yes, I am, actually. What are you doing? Uh, well, it started as a, um, and still is, a um, limited series, eight part, about Abraham Lincoln's vice president, um, whose name was Hannibal Hamlin. Absolutely forgotten to history now, but I got interested in the story, and I'm writing a novel. And he disagreed with Lincoln a lot, did he not? I he, felt like he was definitely Lincoln's sounding board and saying, I don't think I should do that. And Lincoln's <laughs> like, I'm going to do it. <laughs> That's... Well, he... What I found really the bottom to the story... I got interested in the story because I read this small article about the vice president who, in the in the middle of the Civil War, said he didn't like the job. Anyway, he said, fuck it. He went off and he joined the Army and he became a private, uh, wore the uniform and got up at Reveille and marched with the soldiers and then he became a cook at a fort in Maine. Hmm while he was sitting vice president of the United States. And I thought, all right, well, that's, uh, this could be an interesting uh, guy. And I spent a year just reading and researching and making notes and stuff like that. Um, Hamlin was a nag <laughs> to Lincoln. He started avoiding Hamlin. And, and at one point, it, this is... Um, uh, not altogether fictitious, but the specific incident isn't uh, true. It, it didn't take place, but Hamlin walks with him and talks about all this stuff, and Lincoln gets to the war uh, um, department, which was across from the White House. And he gets there, and he says, you know, and this is what he, Lincoln would always do, you know, that reminds me of a joke. And he tells this joke, but the joke doesn't make sense. And Lincoln would do, <laughs> he would do this all the time. He'd finish the joke that doesn't make sense. He'd laugh, and then the other guy would be going, uh, and, I sh I, I know, and then he would go, this has been great. Anyway, we will talk again, and then, <laughs> and then he would exit he into the war department. He was a good founder. He, like, yeah. found. You're standing there trying to figure out what the fuck we were just talking about, and he would use the opportunity to escape. <laughs> he was brilliant. And he's a Marfan. Was a Marfan. What? Marfan syndrome. Lincoln had Marfan syndrome. Oh, yes. You. As do I. Do you know, speaking of him being seven feet tall with his hat on. I, too, am. Seven feet tall with a hat on? You have a... It's got to be a one-foot tall hat, but yes. <laughs> okay. I would, if you have a picture of that, I'd love to see it. <laughs> yeah, me be, too. <laughs> I'd love to see that. Um, you know, when I first started researching this... When this vice president went into the army, um, apparent, well, not apparently, but honestly, um, Lincoln almost was came millimeters twice from being shot in the head. 
and it was astounding to me. And the Fort Stevens incident, do you know about that? I, I do know that there were a couple assassination attempts on his life before the final one, but this was a, just a miss, a stray bullet you're referring to. That was a month later, mm. where they shot him through the hat. Mm. Yeah. Um, this incident took place at Fort Stevens in the north part of Washington, and the Confederates were, <laughs> were coming into Washington and they were attacking this fort. So Lincoln heard about this battle taking place mm -hmm. and he said, he said, I'd like to go, I'd like to go see that battle. And his, his own people were coming in to say, we have a gunboat ready on the Potomac and, you know, we need to have you and your family ready to go in case the Confederates come further into Washington, D.C. And Lincoln said, no, I am going to go watch that battle. And because he's the president, they kind of had to do what he said, but they're like, this is not a good idea. So they take him out to Fort Stevens, and he and the Secretary of War and a very young Oliver Wendell Holmes, who was a sergeant at the time, uh, and several other dignitaries go into Fort Stevens and up on the, it was called a parapet, mm -hmm. which is a wall, an earthen wall that surrounds the fort and protects the fort, and they go up on top of it. So they're standing up there, and the battle is taking place. There are Confederates out there on the across the corner of the fort coming from the uh, uh, from the north west and and Lincoln is looking through the field glasses at the battle taking place and bullets uh, are flying of course and the guy standing right next to Lincoln a surgeon gets shot in the leg and blows his uh, his thigh out he f he falls and he hits the top of the parapet he falls down everybody scrambles for cover except for <laughs> except for Lincoln who's still who's still standing there with the field glasses in his eyes watching the battle and I don't know if this is true or not. I've read several accounts, like five accounts, and some yes, some no, but Oliver Wendell Holmes was said to say, get down, you damn fool. And Lincoln like, looks and said something like, I see you, under, you know how to address uh, the civilian something. So he said something really funny. And... And so he just, and then he went back to watching the battle, and then he told the general how to move the troops back. Meanwhile, they have people in these houses, sharpshooters. They didn't call them uh, snipers. Snipers then, um, sharpshooters, because that's the type of gun they used, sharps guns. Um, but they're in these houses up along the ridge, and they're they're looking through their field glasses, and they're going. And that looks guy like is, a president. <laughs> he's seven feet tall. He got that beard with the hat, and <laughs> God damn it, oh, that might be uh, worth shooting. Is that Daniel Day Lewis? <laughs> <laughs> so they, yeah. Yeah, so they just started, they turned their guns to him and they just started firing away. And so he's got bullets going past and he some there's a couple of theories I don't know I don't necessarily believe them but thought that he was not doing well politically and he just figured oh well if I get shot in the head so what hmm I don't know but the general now uh, I forget his name but he's he's just below Lincoln and he goes mr. Lincoln get down or I will have you taken down and then he reached up and he grabbed Lincoln's arm and he pulls him down and <laughs> and I swear to God this is true every I, I for almost every incident I write about I read five versions of it every one of this says explains this pulls Lincoln down Lincoln finally sits down on his ass and he you know he stretches out his legs and he says I thought I was the commander-in-chief 
<laughs> Dry as a bone, that one. <laughs> I, and this shit, I, like you were saying before, you can't write this stuff. No, it's... I've read a lot of in preparation because I had Abraham Lincoln on the show on the on the podcast. That's right. And it was wonderful. He and will back all this stuff up. Yes, <clears throat> he probably could. Or, uh, well, I could put you in touch with him. In fact, he knows a lot. I... Robert no, really seriously, oh, he does. Absolutely, I can oh, connect you. Guys. Give me his number because yeah, yeah. I, if absolutely. I have a question, I can go. And he's to, wonderful. That's he's great. Really a, a lovely I'm, man. I'm dying for somebody to actually. You'll give have me... to listen to that episode. I think it would take. Okay. Yeah. Great. Great. Yeah. yeah, I feel. I feel it's. It's been almost two hours. I feel like. How long were we supposed to go? I mean, generally go an hour, but the airplanes <gasps> kept. No, it's the airplanes' okay, so fault. That probably just about up a ten hour. minutes. So I have a favor to ask. Okay. If I go home, because I know that I have more questions, but I, what I would like to do is go home and see what is salvageable oh, and all of that. Why? No, no, it's okay. I'm and so then, sorry. We, okay. No, please. And then um, kind of hobble things together and and see where I am. And would you be willing to talk I'd again? I'd love to. Okay, good. I. Because I'm Please. sure it will beget other questions. And I know that there are some uh, uh, questions just about, you know, the other side of your life, the writing side and stuff, the, the television Oh, I stuff love that, that stuff, I, yeah. Yeah, so I just think that it would make for a, a f- more full... Please. Airplane. And we'll sit in your uh, in your um, theater. Movie theater rail. Yeah. Please don't tell anybody I said this, but I, I quite enjoy talking with you. Yay, thank you. Yeah. I appreciate that. Thank you. No, I enjoyed it too. It's really fun. You're a tremendous. You're, uh, uh, you're a tremendous Thank interviewer you. person. Please spread the word. I will. Well. Thank you. No. We'll t- we should talk. Well, we're not on the air now. We right? are. I will. Well, I'll just for for now. Let's say, uh, Russ, Woody, please, uh, please be on the show again. Firstly, secondly, everyone listening. Please, please go get yourself a copy of Tuesdays with Ted. It's really, it's a lovely book. There, it's it evokes so many emotions, and it's wonderful. It'll make you hug the people you love that much tighter. And who knows? Maybe it'll throw a forgiveness bone up into the air. You know, like a wishbone. You pull, you'll see what happens. <laughs> Thanks for listening, everybody. And Russ, thank you so much. Thank you. We will talk again. Yes. Yes. Bye, everybody. 